The lecture you're about to see was filmed in 1983 and it perfectly describes everything happening in America today. Now he makes it a political issue. He demands recognition, respect, human rights, and Hiral is a large group of people. And there are violent clashes between him and police, his group and, and ordinary people, no matter what. It's black against white, yellows against green, doesn't matter where the division line goes. As long as this group come into antagonistic clash, sometimes militantly, sometimes with firearms, that is destabilization. The speaker is Yuri Bezmenov, a former journalist from the Soviet Union who was trained by the KGB on subversion tactics, propaganda, and mass manipulation. He defected to Canada in 1970 after becoming disillusioned with the work he was doing and made it his life's work to expose the manipulation he saw that was happening in America. Now, I want you to listen carefully to this lecture and see if you can connect any dots, because you might just see some shocking parallels between what he is saying and what is happening in our country today. What subversion is? Basically, it consists of four periods, time-wise. If we start from here and go this way, time, right? This is the beginning point. The first stage of subversion is the process which is called Basically, demoralization it says for itself what it is. It takes from, uh, say, 15 to 20 years to demoralize a society. He just said it takes between 15 and 20 years to demoralize a society. Well, the year is 2020. Can you think of any major events that happened about 20 years ago today? Why, why 15 or 20 years? This is the time sufficient to educate one generation of students or children. One generation, one lifetime span of a person, a human being, which is dedicated to study, to shaping up the outlook, ideology, personality. Can you think of a generation that fits that description? I most certainly can. No more, no less. Usually it takes from 15 to 20 years. What it includes? It includes influencing or by various methods, infiltration, uh, propaganda methods, direct contacts, doesn't really matter. I will describe them later. <laughs> of various areas where public opinion is formulated, if it's a free democratic society, there are many different movements within the society. There are obviously, in every society, there are people who are against this society. They may be simple criminals, ideologically in disagreement with the, with the state policy, conscientious enemies, simply psychotic personalities who are against anything. Right? And finally, there are a small group of agents of a foreign nation, bought, subverted, recruited. Right? The moment all these movements will be directed in one direction, Right? This is the time to catch that movement and to continue it until the movement forces the whole society into collapse, into crisis. He's talking about a movement that could take a society and bring it into collapse. Can you think of any movements that fit that description? Right? So that's exactly the martial art tactic. We don't stop an enemy. We let him go. We help him to go in the direction we want them to go. Okay? So, on the stage of demoralization, obviously there are tendencies in each society, in each country, which are going to opposite direction from the basic moral values and principles. You might see the name on the screen Thomas Schumann and be a little confused. Well, Yuri Bezmenov is also Thomas Schumann. He changed his name to Thomas after moving to Canada. 
1970. To take advantage of these movements, to capitalize on them, is the main purpose of the originator of subversion. So we have religion, we have education, we have uh, social life, we have power structure, we have labor relations, uh, unions, and finally we have law and order. Oh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay? These are the areas of application of subversion. What it means exactly, <clears throat> in case of religion, destroy it, ridicule it, replace it with various sects, cults, which bring people's attention, faith, whether it is naive, primitive, doesn't really matter. As long as the basically accepted religious dogma is being slowly eroded and taken away from the supreme purpose of religion, to keep people in touch with, with the supreme being, that serves the purpose. Therefore, replace it, accepted, respected religious organizations with fake organizations. We can see everything he just said playing out in real time, right in front of our eyes. The millennial generation is totally anti-religious and they follow the do-as-thou-will mindset as told by Aleister Crowley. Distract people attention from the real faith and attract them to various different faiths. And that's exactly what the New Age movement is doing, distracting people. Education. Distract them from learning something which is constructive, pragmatic, efficient. Instead of mathematics, physics, foreign languages, chemistry, teach them history of urban warfare, natural food, uh, <laughs> home economy, your sexuality. Do you think it's any coincidence that this is exactly what's happening to our schools today? People aren't taught life skills, they're not taught essential knowledge, they're taught ideologies. Anything, as long as it takes you away, okay? Uh, social life, replace traditionally established institutions and organizations with fake organizations. Take away the initiative from people, take away the responsibility from naturally established links between individuals, group of individuals and society at large, and replace them with artificially, bureaucratically controlled bodies. Instead of social life and friendship between neighbors, establish social workers institutions. The people who are on payroll of whom? Society? No. Bureaucracy. The main concern of social workers is not your family, not you, not social relations between groups of people. The main concern is to get the paycheck from the government. What will be the result of their social work doesn't really matter. They can develop all kinds of concepts to show them, to show to the government and to the people that they're useful. Okay, away from the natural links, power structure. Okay. The natural bodies of administration, which are traditionally either elected by, by people at large or appointed by elected leaders of society, are being actively substituted by artificial bodies. The bodies of people, groups of people, whom nobody elected, never, as a matter of fact, most of the people don't like them at all, and yet they exist. I can think of dozens of organizations that fit that exact bill. Let's see, Council on Foreign Relations, the Trilateral Commission, the Bilderberg Group, and the list goes on. There's dozens of them. One of such group is media. Who elected them? <laughs> how come, how come they, they, pay, they, they, they have so much power? Almost monopolistic power on your mind. They can rape your mind. He's talking about the media in terms of 1983. What we see today is a thousand times worse than what he saw. But who elected them? How come they are, they have a nerve to decide what is good and what is bad for, for the elected by you, President and, and his administration? Who the hell are they? Uh, Spiro Agnew, who was hated by the liberal left, called them a bunch of enfeebled snobs. And that's exactly what they are. They think they know. They don't. 
the, the level of mediocrity in a big establishment like New York Times, Los Angeles Times, major television network, you don't have to be excellent journalist. You have to be exactly a mediocre journalist. That's easier to survive. There's no competition anymore. You have your good, nice income, $100,000 a year. That's it. Whether you are better or worse doesn't really matter anymore. As soon as you're smiling to the camera and do your job. Doesn't this ring truer today than ever before? In this age of mass media manipulation and fake news, what he's saying is definitely on point. <laughs> That's it. No more, no more competition. Power structure slowly uh, is eroded by the bodies and groups of people who do not have neither qualification nor the will of people to keep them in power. And yet they do have power. Okay. Together with that, there is another process. Law enforcement, law and order uh, organization and structure is being eroded. For the last 20, 25 years, you, you, if, if you see old movies and new movies, you can see that in new movies, a policeman, an officer of the United States Army looks dumb, angry, psychotic, paranoid. And now we've seen them take this to the next level. We're seeing defund the police. We're seeing the police demonized on a global scale. And it's happening right in front of our eyes. A criminal looks nice, kind of. Well, he smokes hash and, and shoots the uh, whatever drug. But basically, he's a nice human being. He's creative. And he's unproductive only because society oppresses him. Whereby a general of Pentagon is always, by definition, a dumb, a war maniac. A policeman is a pig, rude policeman. He abuses his power. It's kind of scary how accurate this is, considering it was made in 1983, and it perfectly is describing what people are saying right now about police officers. No, a generality, generalization like that. The hatred, the mistrust to the people who are supposed to protect you and enforce law and order. Moral relativity. The Angela Buona process lasted two years in Los Angeles. And yet there are still some lawyers who say, look, he's a nice character, as a matter of fact. There was some witness who said, also a criminal, who said, well, he's a nice guy. I asked him one day to burn a house of my enemy, and he wouldn't do it. <laughs> it's a nice fellow. A rosy. A slow substitution of basic moral principles, <coughs> whereby a criminal is not a criminal, actually. He's a defendant, even if his guilt is proven. There is still a doubt. Okay, labor relations. At this stage, within 15 to 20 years, we destroy the traditionally established links of bargaining between employer and employee. The classical Marxist-Leninist uh, theory of natural exchange of goods. Uh, a person A has five sacks of grain and person B has five pairs of shoes. And the natural exchange without money is when they bargain between each other. And only with the introduction of the third force C, uh, an entirely third foreign stranger who says, no, don't give him five sacks of grain, give it to me. And you give me your five pairs of shoes and I will distribute it accordingly. So that the economy will go. This is the death of natural exchange, the death, death of natural bargaining. Well, trade unions were established 100 years ago. The objective was to improve working conditions and to protect the rights of workers from those employers who were abusing their, their right because they had more money. Objectively, at that time, initially, the trade union movement did work. What we see now is that the bargaining pro process is no longer resulting into, in the compromise, which is leading objectively to betterment of working conditions and increase of salary. What we see is that after each prolonged strike, the workers lose. Even if they have 10% increase of their salaries, they cannot catch up due to inflation and due to missed time. 
More than that, millions of people suffer from that strike because economy now is interdependent. It's intertwined like one body. If previously uh, steel workers, say 100 years ago, could strike and nobody would suffer, now it's impossible anymore. If a garbage collector strikes today, the rest of the multi-million city is stinking. I mean, the, the, there's no more service. Uh, in Quebec, for example, we had the electricians who were on strike in the middle of winter. You can freeze your bottom, and they still were on strike. Did they catch up with the salary? No, they lost. Who benefited? The leaders of trade union. We just saw this exact scenario unfold with the whole COVID-19 lockdown. We were told some businesses were essential, therefore they were allowed to stay open and make money while other businesses were forced to shut down. And who profited the most from all this? Let's see, Amazon, Walmart, all the big companies profited while the small mom and pop places were almost bankrupt. What is the motivation for strike? Improving, improving a, wor a worker's condition? No. Obviously, it's not. Then what is it? Ideology. To prove to these capitalists. And the obedient horde of workers, like sheep, follow these people. And they cannot disobey. Why? Because if they do, you know what happens to them. I was made to believe by media, by business, by advertising agencies, that I need more and more and more. Have you ever heard any advertising on TV to consume less? No. No way. Whether you need a, a, a six-cylinder car or not, you have to buy it. And hurry up. <laughs> when I was driving here on the local radio station, an excited announcer said, you hurry up, rush and save, save, save. There is a pantyhose sale. <laughs> save by buying more. But what we did when I was working for Novosti Press, we would snow plow editorial offices, student organizations, religious group with literature of class struggle, May, if, if not directly Marxism, Leninist propaganda, then a propaganda of, of a legitimate aspirations of working class, betterment of life, equality. And the absolute equality exists in Soviet Union quote-unquote equality. Everybody is equal in, in dirt, except some people are more equal than the others in Politburo. <laughs> <laughs> so, the moment you, you bring a country to the point of almost total demoralization, when nothing works anymore, when you are not sure whether it is right or, or wrong, good and bad, but there is no division between evil and good, when even the leaders of church sometimes say, well, violence for the sake of justice, especially social justice. Violence for the sake of social justice. Sound familiar? It sure sounds a lot like Antifa. Say, well, violence for the sake of justice, especially social justice, is justified in a countries like Nicaragua, El Salvador, well, maybe Rhodesia. And we listen to them and say, yeah, Probably it's true. Is it true? No, it is not true. Violence is not justified, especially for the sake of quote-unquote social justice introduced by Marxist-Leninism. Demoralization through social justice. It should be the anthem for 2020. The next step is destabilization. Again, this word says for itself what it is. To destabilize all the relations, all the accepted institutions and organizations in a country of your enemy. How you do it? You don't have to send a, a battalion of KGB agents to blow up bridges. No. You let them do it themselves. The area of application is, again, it's, it's, it's narrower now. Not like the, the previous case. The overt legitimate actions... Of the, of the KGB in this case would be ha hardly noticeable. There is no crime if a professor who recently went to USSR introduces a course of Marxism-Leninism in, in a, a, a Californian college, for example. Nobody is going to, to come to his doorstep and say, okay, mister, come 
you are under arrest. No, it's not a crime. It's not even considered a moral crime against your country. So the area of application here is narrowing down to ec economy, again, labor relations, right? To law and order. Destabilization of a country through the economy, through the lack of law and order, and through Marxist-Leninist ideals. All you have to do is turn on the TV today, and you can see many different examples of this playing out in real time. Plus military. And uh, economy, law and order. Yes, and again, the uh, media, but uh, wider scope, a little bit different. I'll explain it later. Okay, basically, three areas. Economy side. Here, it's radicalization. On, this, on the stage of destabilization, we cannot come to compromise even within a family. The husband and wife couldn't figure out which is better. And we see this exact scenario playing out in homes all over America. Families are dividing over their support for Donald Trump. Families are dividing over their support for Black Lives Matter. Families are dividing over support for defund the police, etc. It's happening right in front of our eyes. They cannot come to compromise unless they start a fight. It's impossible to reach a compromise, constructive compromise, between neighbors. Some people say, I don't like you to work during your loan at that time, because exactly at that time I'm walking my dog and he's getting nervous. He cannot uh, pass his bowels, you know. So They cannot compromise. They go to a, a, a civil court or something like that. Radicalization of human relations. No more compromise. Fight, fight, fight. The normal, traditionally accepted relations are destabilized. Again, this is what our country has become. You can no longer have a civil conversation with anybody without fear of triggering them and having them go completely insane over their ideological views of the world. The relations between teachers and students in schools and colleges fight. The, the relations between, in economical sphere between laborers and, and employers are further uh, radicalized. No more acceptance of the legitimacy of demands of workers. Unlike Japanese, with the theory Z, if you, if you ever heard about it, where the workers are involved in the decision-making process, therefore they don't have uh, moral incentive to, to fight the, uh, their bosses. In the United States, it's just the opposite. The harder is the, the fight, the better. The more heroic they look. When the Greyhound uh, network was on strike recently, the correspondents of local TV networks uh, all over the United States were approaching the strikers and they say, oh, yes, we are doing something nice. They look like heroes and they were proud. There was some family. Uh, the husband was a uh, bus driver. Now they decided in, 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 in a protest against the... Uh, uh, bosses to camp somewhere in the forest. And they were presented to the, to the audience as, as a heroic, nice people. You see? The violent clashes between passengers, picketers, and, and the strikers are presented as something normal. 10, 15, 20 years ago, we would, we would, be, uh, we would be angry. Say, why, why, why so much hatred? And what he just said is 10 times worse today, with these quote-unquote protesters tearing down statues and renouncing our American history, just because it doesn't fit in with their ideological worldview. Today we are not. We say, well, commonplace. Radicalization, militarization sometimes. As I explained uh, on that stage, I, I took a step a little bit further. Shooting people. Okay, law and order now also is uh, pushed into the area where previously people settled their differences uh, peacefully and legitimately. Now, we are getting with this uh, uh, court cases in the, in the smallest irrelevant cases. We cannot solve our problems anymore. The society at large becomes more and more antagonistic between individuals, between groups of individuals, and the society at large. The media puts himself in the opposition to the society in general, at large. 
separate, alienated. Okay? On that stage, you remember I was talking uh, a, a couple of hours ago about the sleepers. That's when the students from, say, United States, if they are trained in, in Lumumba University, or developing nations, that's the students I was dealing with, are being sent back from the Soviet Union here. Or if they were already in the United States, in the country, which is an object of, of subversion, they spring to action. The sleepers go up. They slept for 15 to 20 years. Now they become leaders of groups, preachers, uh, I don't know, public, public figures. Prominently, they act. In, they actively include themselves in a political process. Now he makes it a political issue. He demands recognition, respect, human rights, and Hiral is a ra large group of people. And there are violent clashes between him and police, his group and, and ordinary people, no matter what. It's black against white, yellows against green, doesn't matter where the division line goes. As long as this group come into antagonistic clash, sometimes militantly, sometimes with firearms, that is destabilization process. The sleepers become leaders of the process of destabilization. Doesn't mean that Comrade Andropov sends Comrade Ivanov to the United States. The person who takes care is already here. He is a respected citizen of the United States. Sometimes he, he gets money from various foundations for, for his legitimate uh, struggle for, I don't know, human rights, women rights, kid lib, prison lib, whatever. Again, we can see this playing out in real time with certain people such as George Soros paying for these movements and allowing them to prosper. This stabilization process usually leads directly to the process of crisis. In case of developing nations, that's the area where I, I was active, the process starts when, when the legitimate bodies of power, the social structure collapse, it's, it cannot function anymore. Demoralization, destabilization, and crisis. Where do you think we are right now? So instead, we have artificial body injected into society, such as non-elected committees. Non-elected committees, we call them NGOs. You remember I was talking about them here, social workers, who are not elected by people, media, who, sell, who are self-appointed rulers of your opinion, uh, some strange groups uh, which claim that they know how to lead society forward. They don't usually. All they care is how to collect the nations and, and, prom and sell their own concocted ideology, mixture of religion and ideology. Here, we have all this artificial body claiming power. If the power is denied to them, they take it by force. If power is denied to them, they take it by force. Where have we seen that recently? We've seen this play out in Seattle with the whole Chaz or CHOP movement. Okay, crisis is when society cannot function any more productively. It collapses, obviously, that's the word for crisis. So therefore, the population at large is looking for a savior. The religious groups are expecting a messiah to come. The workers say, we have family to feed. Let's have a strong government, maybe socialist government, centralized. When, when somebody put, put the employers on their place and, and let us work, we are sick and tired of going to strike and, and missing overtime and all that stuff. We need some strong man, strong government, a leader, a savior is needed. The things are going to get so bad. The people are going to be calling out for a Messiah, looking for a Savior. Where have we heard that before? Well, the Bible tells us this exact scenario is going to play out, and the Savior is going to be the Antichrist. Population is sick and tired already. And here we are. We have a Savior. Either a foreign nation comes in, or the local group of, of leftists, Marxists, no matter what they call themselves, Sandinista. 
a reverend or, or some sort, Bishop Muzureva, like in, in Zimbabwe, doesn't matter. A savior comes and says, I will lead you. So we have two alternatives here. Civil war and invasion. Okay? See how it goes? Civil war, we know what it is. Lebanon is, is the best example. The civil war, which was artificially implanted in Lebanon by injection of force of PLO, Palestinian Liberation Organization. Invasion, we had in many other countries like Afghanistan, uh, name any East European country, it, it was invaded by the Soviet army. But the result is the same. The next stage is normalization. Normalization is a very ironic word, of course. It is borrowed from 1968 situation in Czechoslovakia, when the Soviet propaganda and after them, New York Times declared the country is normalized. The tanks moved into Prague, so there is no more Prague Spring. There is no more violence. Normal. Normalization. At that stage, the self-appointed rulers of the society don't need any revolution anymore. They don't need any radicalism anymore. So this is the reverse from destabilization. Basically, it is stabilizing the country by force. So all the sleepers and activists and social workers and liberals and professors and Marxists and Leninists are being eliminated physically sometimes. They've done their job already. Okay? They are not needed anymore. The new rulers need stability to exploit the nation, to exploit the country, to take advantages of the victory. Okay? So no more revolutionaries, please. Okay. So to reverse this process, from here, it takes only and always military force. No other force on earth can reverse this process at this point. At this point, it does not take military invasion of United States Army. It takes strong action, like in Chile, a CIA covert involvement to prevent the savior from outside to come into power and to stabilize country before it erupts into civil war. Okay? Support the right-wing conservative forces. Buy money, buy crooks or love, doesn't matter. Stabilize the country. Don't let the crisis develop into, into civil war or invasion. Oh, no, your liberals will say it's, it's against the law. Should we wait till the normalization come and Soviet tanks land in, in, in Los Angeles airport? Now, at that point, at the point of destabilization, also the process could be reversed. Again, easily than this. No CIA involvement at this point. You know what it takes here? Restriction of some liberties for small groups which are self-declared enemies of the society. As simple as that. Do not elect them to the seats of power, whether it is municipality level, state level, or federal level. So the answer to ideological subversion, strangely enough, is very simple. You don't have to shoot people. You don't have to aim mi missiles and Pershings and cruise missiles at Andropov's headquarters. You simply have to have faith and prevent subversion. In other words, not to be a victim of subversion. Don't try to be a person who in Zudo is trying to smash your enemy and being caught by your hand. Don't strike like that. Strike with the power of your spirit and moral superiority. If you don't have that power, it's high time to develop it. And that's the only answer. That's it. Thank you. So what do you think about that? Is he accurate? Is he describing what's happening in America today? Please leave a comment, and if you haven't done so already, please hit that like button. And don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. And I want to thank you all for watching, and until next time, God bless you all.